the speaker. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen, amen, namaste. Auto affirmation announcements by the speaker. Honorable members, Mr. Esmond Ford, MP, member for Tunapuna, has requested leave of absence from sittings of the House from November 26 to December 13, 2018. Dr. Fuad Khan, MP, member for Barataria San Juan, has requested leave of absence from sittings of the House from November 29th to December 9th, 2018. And the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, MP, member for St. Joseph, has requested leave of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the members... The <laughs> member Dr. Bodo, member for Faisabad, has requested leave of, sit of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the members seek is granted. Honorable members, I wish to advise of temporary appointments of members to the Committee of Privileges. Honorable members, I will defer this matter till later in the sitting. Honorable members, I am also to advise of correspondence I have received from the President of the Senate dated November 30, 2018, which states as follows. Dear Honorable Speaker, change of membership to joint select committees. I wish to inform you that at a sitting held on Tuesday, November 27, 2018, the Senate agreed to the following resolution. Be it resolved that the Senate agree to the following appointments to the Joint Select Committees. Mr. Garvin Simonet, in lieu of Mr. Ronald Huggins, and Ms. Amrita Dionorine, in lieu of Ms. Jennifer Raful, on the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee. Ms. Shari Sipasad, in lieu of Ms. Melissa Ramkisun, on the Public Accounts Committee. Ms. Amrita Dionorine, in lieu of Mr. David Small, on the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee. Mr. Diorup Timal, in lieu of Mr. Stephen Kreese, on the Joint Select Committee Land and Physical Infrastructure. Dr. Varma Dinal Singh, in lieu of Mr. H. R. Ian Roach, on the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory, Statutory Authorities including the THA. Mr. Anthony Vera, in lieu of Mr. David Small, and Mr. Garvin Simonet, in lieu of Mr. Ronald Huggins, on the Joint Select Committee on State Enterprises. Mr. Diuro Timal, in lieu of Mr. David Small, on the Joint Select Committee on Energy Affairs. Mrs. Hazel Thompson Ahi, in lieu of Dr. Danishar Mihaber, on the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights, Equality and Diversity. Dr. Varma Dial Singh, in lieu of Mr. H. R. Ian Roach, on the Joint Select Committee on Government Assurances. Dr. Varma Dial Singh, 
in lieu of Ms. Melissa Ramke Soon on the Joint Select Committee on Gambling, Gaming and Betting Control Bill 2016. Mr. Anthony Vieira, in lieu of Ms. Melissa Ramke Soon on the Joint Select Committee on Cybercrime Bill 2017. Dr. Maria Dillon Remy, in lieu of Dr. Danisha Mehabia, on the Joint Select Committee on the Constitution Amendment, Tobago Self-Government Bill 2018. Ms. Shari Sipasad, in lieu of Mr. Stephen Kreese, on the Joint Select Committee on the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill 2018, and the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018. Ms. Amrita Dionorain, in lieu of Mr. Torel Shikisun, and Mr. Diro Timal, in lieu of Ms. Jennifer Raful, on the Joint Select Committee on the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Bill 2018. Mr. Avinash Singh, in lieu of Ms. Ayanna Lewis, and Dr. Maria Dillon Remy, in lieu of Mr. Torel Shikisun, on the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Broadcasting. And Dr. Maria Dillon Remy, in lieu of Dr. Danishaw Mahabia on the Joint Select Committee on Foreign Affairs. Accordingly, I respectfully request that the House of Representatives be informed of this decision at the earliest convenience, please. Yours respect respectfully, Christine Kanglu, President of the Senate. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have the honor to lay the following papers. The report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Princess Town Regional Corporation for the year ended September 30th, 2016. Papers two and three, the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Sangri Grandi Regional Corporation for the years ended September 30th, 2012 and 2013. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that papers one to three be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. Honorable members, the question is that papers one to three be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Minister of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation vesting amendment to the first schedule number three order 2018. Reports from committees. Member for Digo Martin, Northeast. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have the honor and pleasure to present the report of the Special Select Committee of the House of Representatives on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018. Come in. Prime Minister's questions, urgent questions. Member for Karini East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Health, I don't know who it is, but um, in light of recent reports of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, or hand foot and mouth disease, at the Astra Boys Primary School, could the Minister state why there have been no public advisories and measures undertaken so far by the Ministry to address these reports. PWLs. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to advise that in response to alleged cases of hand, foot, and mouth disease at the Azure Primary School, San Fernando, a visit was conducted to, to the school by a combined healthcare team comprising members of the County Medical Office of Health, Office Victoria, the San Fernando City Corporation Public Health Department and the Southwest Regional Health Authority on Thursday, 29th of November. They identified individuals complaining of gastroenteritis-like symptoms, which included fever, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but not hand, foot, and mouth disease, as was reported. There were 42 individuals identified as having gastro-like symptoms from the standard one and two classes, all of whom reported the symptoms were not severe and no one was hospitalized. The city public health department reported that the school and environs were clean and free of harborage of mosquitoes and rodents. The school has been sanitized to rid it of potential microbiological pathogens. 
as a precautionary measure, students from the affected classes and their siblings only were advised to stay at home today, Friday the 30th of November. Sampling will be conducted to identify a potential microbiological cause for this episode. Classes are expected to resume as normal on Monday the 3rd of December 2018. As a result, there was no need for advisories in this matter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Supplemental member for Karen East. In view of your answer, what would you tell the hundreds of parents of these children who are undergoing widespread apprehension, fear, and panic, knowing the issue of hand, foot, and mouth disease possibly exists at the school? I will not allow that as a supplemental question having regard to the response. Supplemental member for Karen East. Have you confirmed, can you confirm or deny whether there is an outbreak of hand, foot and mouth disease or not? Uh, member for Karen East, having regard to the question that was asked and the answer was give, which was given, that does not arise as a supplemental question. Supplemental Karen East. What are you, what do you intend to tell the parents of these children attending the school? Remember, for Karen East, I believe in a very comprehensive response which was given. That was also answered. Member for Coover South. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs, given the decision of the government to close down the operations of Petrotrin by November 30th, 2018, Today. could the Minister inform this House how many former employees of Petrotrin have been rehired at the Heritage Petroleum Company, Paria Fuel Trading Company, and Guaracara Company? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, with regards to Heritage, which is really now the core company, as of today, we have hired 39 senior and middle managers. Of that 39, 16 are former Petrotrin employees, and 23 are former, well, former non-employees of Petrotrin. With regards to Paria Trading, the, we have employed three senior managers, two are former Petrotrin employees, and one is a non-employee of Petrotrin. With regards to Garakara Refining Company Limited, no body has been employed to date, and because that company will be the, the custodian of the refinery assets, and there will be very limited employment in that company. There will just be a custodian, and that employment will take place very shortly. Supplemental, member for Coover South. Given the numbers that you have best presented to the House Minister, could you provide this House with the categories of the numbers and the under what terms and conditions they have been hired? I'm not too sure the categories of the... He has indicated, Madam uh, Speaker, that um, in one instance there's 39. So out of this 39, whether well, there's five in a particular skill set and so on. And so I'm seeking the numbers in terms of the categories and also under what terms and conditions. Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Madam Speaker, I am willing to supply the titles of the, po the positions that they were employed under, but the terms and conditions, I guess, they should be confidential to the employee. So in that regard, I can provide the first instance. Member for Coover South. Uh, also taking into consideration that the Prime Minister gave a commitment at a public meeting in Marabella that former employees of Petrotrin will become shareholders of these new entities. Could you tell us how many of these new, of these former employees are shareholders of the three new entities. I will not allow that as a supplemental question. Member for Coover South. 
Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs, given the decision of the government to close down the operations of Petrotrain by the 30th of November 2018, could the Minister inform this House as to whether employees who contributed to Petrotrain employees' pension plan were all given benefit statements prior to the date of closure? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Madam Speaker, individual benefit statements were issued to all employees prior to the closure date, which is today. Supplemental, Member for Kuva South. Could the Minister advise the South whether these benefit statements were audited? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. I am, un I am unable at this time to, to say so. Supplemental, Member for Kuva South. Could the Minister also inform this House whether the retirees of the said pension plan were given audited uh, benefit statements also? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. If the, if the retirees were given audited statements, the, the plan is in effect. So all their benefits are already being paid to them. Member for Point Appeal. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, given that today is the last day, November 30th, of the operations at Petrotrin, could the Minister state whether all processes required to secure the refinery, as well as comply with environmental standards, have been executed in an effort to prevent any environmental or mechanical mishaps? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to announce that as we speak, all plans and processing plans at the Petrotrin refinery has been safely shut down in accordance with proper environmental practices. All hydrocarbons have been removed and the entire processing plants have been placed under a nitrogen atmosphere, which is an inert atmosphere to save corrosion and, 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 and um, fires and ignitions and what have you. So as we speak, the refinery has been closed, the steam plants have been done, and everything is, is safe. And as we go out now for an RFP for proposal for somebody to run the refinery. Supplemental, members point up here. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Energy Supplemental, could you state whether the environmental agency gave a certificate of clearance of, of what you just described of the shutdown and the process that you just described? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. These are routine operations. You don't need a certificate of environmental clearance. But obviously, all these activities were taken in consultation and under the supervision of the EME. Supplemental, member for point of Pair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Minister, um, in your question, in your response to question number two, where you said there are no employees at Guaracara Company which will be responsible for the refinery, what, given that there are no employees presently and the refinery is shut down now, what, what are the environmental issues that I envision could happen when there are no watch keepers or individuals that would be ensuring that? What is the question? The question is, given that there are no employees employed at the Guaracara refinery that are responsible to shut down the refinery going forward, what, uh, what will happen and for the environmental issues where there are no employees? Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Madam Speaker, <coughs> there are no employees at present employed with Guaracara refining. However, third party service contracts have been awarded, so there is staff who is monitoring the refinery, supervising the refinery, doing men maintenance work as we speak. And that contract, I, I, I could make it public, it was a public RFP, and it was won by Demos Limited. Member for Orpuch West. To the Minister of National Security. With regard to the use of police and army uniforms by criminals to commit serious crimes, most recently in the kidnapping of a UV employee, could the minister indicate how he intends to curtail the use of these uniforms by criminals? Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, first of all, 
in the unfortunate incident with the kidnapping of someone at UE this week. Uh, let's just like to put on record, it was not a police uniform used. It was a bulletproof vest that had a police emblem on it. They were not army uniforms used, but it were camouflage fatigues used. Of course, the, these, the use of these items is of serious concern to the government, and in particular, the Ministry of National Security. We have been engaged in conversations with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, as well as the Defense Force, to ensure ask them to put more measures in place, ensuring it is not legitimate police and defense force uniforms being used in the committal of these crimes. Unfortunately, there have been a few incidents where this has taken place, and those who are detected are prosecuted. Supplemental member for Oropuch West. Um, are there any known cases, Minister, in which these uniforms are either loaned out or borrowed by persons who commit these offenses? The answer is yes, in one of the recent kidnappings, and those persons are now behind bars. And as I'm being reminded from my colleague to the back, it is a crime to utilize either the police uniforms or defense force uniforms. Supplemental member for St. Augustine. To the Honorable Minister of um, National Security, could you indicate if there have been further enhanced security measures put in place in and around the University of the West Indies since? I will not allow that based on the question asked. Member for Oropuchis. Thank you very much. Um, in light of the responses of the minister, could the minister indicate whether or not the government may consider reviewing the laws that relates to penalties for persons in possession of those uh, items and or equipment that you identified? Earlier? Minister of National Security. As I had stated yesterday, Madam Speaker, we are currently, the Ministry of National Security is currently looking at the policy with respect to camouflage in particular, with respect to the use of police uniforms in an unauthorized manner. What I can foresee is the increase in the fines and penalties related to same. <coughs> Before Oropu To the Minister of National Security, with regard to the recent kidnapping of an of an employee of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, could the minister please indicate what measures will be implemented to ensure the safety of the staff and students at UWE? Minister of National Security. It does not. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as members may be aware, the University of West Indies' campus and their premises are private. They have their own estate police in place. Obviously, there are issues with respect to the security and the securing of persons on the premises. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has been leading the conversation with them, and in particular, the Commissioner of Police is in direct contact with the university campus security personnel, as well as the principal and others. And any support that can be given, the Ministry of National Security has asked that they do provide such support. Supplemental member for St. Augustine. To the Honorable Minister of National Security, um, has the mobile police post been removed from the campus? Minister of National Security. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I don't have the answer for that particular question. Honorable members, question time with respect to urgent questions is now spent. Leader of the House. <coughs> questions for oral answer. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are three questions for oral answer. All three will be answered. There are no questions for written answer. Member for Orupuch West. Question number four to the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. The Ministry of, Lo of Rural Development and Local Government through the regional corporations of Siparia and Pinal Debe has not only initiated but maintained a comprehensive system of drainage, maintenance and management within their regions. With respect to the issue of clogged drains and watercourses, a coordinated program is in place to clean, 
clear and diesel drains and water courses in the San Francisco and Woodland areas within the Superior Regional Corporation. It should be noted that within the last year, several water courses were cleaned, cleared, and desilted with a track excavator in seven identified areas. Drains were cleaned and cleared using manual labor in 13 areas of San Francisco and Woodland. Drainage construction works were done on box drains in, in five areas, such as Centeno Branch Trace and Sukaran Trace, to name a few. The program of drainage construction will continue in the present financial year 2018-2019 in five additional areas, such as Bachu Trace, Sukal Trace, amongst others. With respect to mosquito eradication, a comprehensive and coordinated exercise was undertaken within the last two months in seven areas. This exercise included source reduction program, and this program includes a public sensitization program with property owners on the issue of environmental sanitation. Two, truck-mounted ultra-low volume spraying in Maria David Trace and Murray Trace. Three, spraying using Dynafogging unit at Murray Trace, Red Hill Trace, and Maria David Trace. With respect to the drainage areas which fall under the purview of the Pinal de Bay Regional Corporation, particularly the electoral district of La Fortune, it should be noted that the corporation conducts routine maintenance and cleaning of all drains, as well as conducts routine dynafogging and bulk waste removal in these areas. Extensive works by way of projects under the development program have been undertaken in fiscal 2017-2018, which included the construction of box drains, box culverts, curb wall and slipper drains, and road paving projects. Additionally, development program projects scheduled to be undertaken in fiscal 2018-2019 for the electoral district of La Fortune would involve road paving works, construction of box drains, culverts, and retaining walls, the details of which I can make available to members. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member for Orupuch West. Thank you. Question number five to the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Madam Speaker, I thank my colleague for the question, but Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries has no involvement in a project called the Friendship Estate Agropark. Thank you. Member for Orpuch West. Um, Honorable Minister, but there is an allocation of 10 million under the budget. So under whose purview does that fall? Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries has no involvement in a project called the Friendship Estate Agropark. Thank you. Okay. Member for Orpuch West. Yeah. Ready money, go Next, question. Next uh, question, question. Question number six to the Minister of Trade and Industry. Minister of Trade and Industry. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Uh, the dates of publication in the daily newspapers for request to tender are as follows. December 17th, 2017, in the, in the news day. December 8th, 2017, in the Guardian newspaper. December 9th, 2017, in the Express newspaper. December 10th, 2017, in the Express, in the Guardian, and the Newsday newspapers. To question, to part B, 12 tender applications were received, and to C, the selected contractor was Roscon Limited. John? Member for Old Pooch West. Um, Honorable Minister, what criteria was used to select Roscon Limited? Minister of Trade and Industry. So I'm sorry, I don't have that information in its totality before me, but I can always supply it to you. Supplemental. Member for Old Pooch West. Honorable Minister, you would agree with me that you do agro-processing once there is an excess supply of any commodity. The question is, are there any crops produced in this country domestically that is in the excess supply 
to warrant an agro processing unit at this point in time. I'm not going to allow that as a supplemental question. Member for point up here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister, could you state what is the value of that contract that was awarded to Roscon Limited? Minister of Trade and Industry. Thank you. The value of the contract is $77 million. Request for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance. Statements by ministers, personal explanations, introduction of bills, motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a minister, public business, committee business, motions. Member for Digo Martin, North East. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Honorable members, I am hearing some interference that is reaching me. I'd ask members please to observe standing order 53. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Be it resolved that this House adopt the report of the Special Select Committee of the House of Representatives on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018. Yeah, please. 36 1 C of the standing orders. Honorable Member for Superior, I overrule the objection. This matter was um, given a time limit for today in the last hearing. The matter was given a time limit with respect to receiving the report of the committee. What we are now dealing with is the debate on that report, which 361C makes very clear that at least one day's notice on a government motion must be given. So the report, yes, agreed. The report is to have come back, but we are not just dealing with the laying of a report now. We are dealing with a motion to debate that report. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, 361C is clear that there should be one day's notice. Madam Speaker, you would recall that on the adjournment last Friday, I indicated quite clearly that we will send this matter to the, to the select committee. And on the 30th, which is the day we adjourn to at 1.30, we would proceed to debate this matter to a vote. We said that, and in any event, Madam Speaker, that the House regulates its own business. But, Madam Speaker, that is clearly what I said when I adjourned the House. So there was seven days notice. There was seven days notice. There was no report at that point in time. Page, a 96-page report at about midnight last night. The standing order is very clear. Where was it? About, yeah, it was 12.49. 12.49 a.m. 36.1 C is the standing order. It is our respectful view to proceed with that debate without the requisite notice is in breach of the standing order 36 1 C. Honorable members, I am certain that the Hansard would support the point that when the matter, this matter was adjourned last Friday, what was indicated was that the matter would be debated today. So the only sense that could mean is that the report, which, is the, which was, the report was non-existent, but the House resolved that it would go to a special select committee, which would report by today, and the debate, and the debate would have taken place. 
today. Okay, notice was given to all of us. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on at the last, Madam Speaker, there's a lot of noise. It's difficult to talk. Please proceed, Member Fadigo Martin. It's on both sides. And that's not a joke either. So, Madam Speaker, at, on the last occasion, at a sitting held on Friday, the 23rd of November, 2018, a special select committee was established by the House of Representatives to consider and report on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018. The mandate of the committee was to consider and report on a bill entitled the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and to report by Friday 30, 2018. And may I make the point, Madam Speaker, I'm being disturbed. Madam Speaker, I'm being disturbed. All members will be entitled to join in the debate and make their contribution at the proper time. Member Fadigo Martin, no cease. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. For the record, a committee, a committee can only report to the House. A committee cannot do anything else. It is the House that resolves to debate a matter. A committee cannot do that. So that the mandate of this committee was to consider and report on the bill and to report to the House by Friday, November 30th, 2018. The House itself was notified last week that when this report arrived here today, this would be debated. Madam Speaker, I need to move on now, despite the fact that I'm being disturbed by Separia and Naparima. At the first meeting on the Monday 26th, because we move with dispatch, Madam Speaker, so the committee was established on Friday last, and on Monday, the committee had its first procedural meeting, and I was elected as chairman in accordance with the standing orders of the House. The committee had two meetings, Madam Speaker. We had a meeting on the 26th of November, last week, Monday, and we had a meeting on Wednesday, the 28th. On the 28th of November, Madam Speaker, after our in-camera meeting, we had a live hearing on Channel 11, that is the Parliament television channel, and on the Parliament radio station, 105.5, and it was also broadcast live on Parl View, the Parliament's YouTube channel. So that the hearing that we had was live on television, on radio, and on social media. The committee, like all committees, had the power to send for persons, papers, and records to report to the House, to appoint advisors, etc. At that sitting, sorry, at that hearing, Madam Speaker, we had representations made by a number of important stakeholders who have a critical and keen interest in the passage of this legislation. These included His Excellency Ad Bizinbrock, the ambassador of the delegation of the European Union to Trinidad and Tobago, and his participation in the hearing was very important because we find ourselves in a situation where we are under the microscope from three organizations, Madam Speaker. The Global Forum, which is a group of countries who have come together to agree to share tax information, among other things. The EU Council of Ministers, which is moving on its own accord. It is independent from the Global Forum. And the Financial Action Task Force and its regional subgroup, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. So it was very important that the ambassador 
for the delegation of the European Union came and spoke to the committee. We also had four persons from the Bankers Association, the chairman of the Bank Banking Association Legal Committee, the chairman of the Bankers Association Forex Committee, the chairman of the Bankers Association Compliance Committee, and the chief compliance officer of Republic Bank Limited. So we had four important persons coming to, Madam Speaker, a constant drone from members opposite. I ask for your protection. Minister Finance, please direct your contribution here and rise above any sort of... Try my best. Please. Here he goes again. So we had four persons from the Bankers Association, from the Legal Committee, the Forex Committee, the Compliance Committee, and a, and a senior compliance officer from the leading bank. We also had representatives from the National Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism of Financing of Terrorism Committee, also known as NAMLAC. We had the Director of the Financial Intelligence Unit, the Deputy Director of the Financial Intelligence Unit, Legal Counsel to the Securities and Exchange Commission, legal con two Legal Counsel for the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the head of the Financial Intelligence Branch of the Police Service, Legal Counsel of the Anti-Terrorism Desk at the Ministry of the Attorney General. We had the Manager of Anti-Money Laundering at the Central Bank, a Senior Counsel from the Central Bank, Senior Legal Counsel, sorry, and an Examiner from the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. So those were nine representatives of the National Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Financing of Terrorism Committee. We also had, from the Board of Land Revenue, the Chairman of the Board, the Chief State Counsel from the Board of Land Revenue, the Commissioner in Charge of Audit and Compliance at the Board of Land Revenue, and the Director of Information and Communications Technology at the Board of Land Revenue. Again, from the Financial Intelligence Unit, we had the Director and the Deputy Director. And as I stated previously, we had the person from the Financial Investigation Branch of the Police Service. We also had from AMCHAN, American Chamber, Trian Tobago, Mr. Narad Tawari, the Chief Executive Officer, and a Research Officer. Also from the Trian Tobago Chamber of Commerce, we had a Director, and three members representing uh, industry members of the Chamber. So in total, Madam Speaker, we had appearing before us six, seven, 11, 20, 25 important stakeholders ranging from the European Union, Bankers Association, National Anti-Monty Laundering Committee, Inland Revenue, FIU, FIB, Amchan, and Trinidad Tobago Chamber. And we engaged in very comprehensive and wide-ranging discussions on the afternoon of Wednesday, the 28th of November. And I believe we broke up, my mem if my memory is correct, we broke up sometime after 5 o'clock. So we had several hours of live sessions. At the public hearing, Madam Speaker, we learnt of a number of things that I think it is very, very important for the general public and members opposite to be aware of. The ambassador from the European Union, and all of this is in this report, Madam Speaker, the ambassador from the European Union made it clear that the main driver behind all of this is the tax transparency standard, global interest in tax transparency, global interest in trying to stamp out tax evasion and tax avoidance, and all the associated issues such as money laundering and terrorist financing that go with, with lack of transparency in tax matters. The ambassador also told us what will happen if we do not pass the income tax amendment bill. And one of the things that will happen is that European community members will be authorized to take what is called defensive measures. And I'll explain to the House and to the population what is a defensive measure? A defensive measure is a termination of correspondent banking. And for those who 
do not know what correspondent banking is. If any business person or citizen in Trinidad and Tobago has to do a transaction involving a transfer of funds, either coming in or coming out, so a businessman would wish to buy raw materials for his business and pay for these raw materials by wire transfer, and a businessman would also seek to get paid for goods that may have been exported to one of these European Union countries, and again get paid by wire transfer. That's one aspect, very crucial aspect of correspondent banking. The banks in Trinidad and Tobago deal with particular banks in large financial centers such as London, Paris, Rome, and so on. So that our banks here would have a relationship with a particular bank in London, England, for example. And in order to make a payment to a supplier in, say, the south of France, or to receive money and transmit it to a Trinidad and Tobago company from someone who has received Trinidad and Tobago goods, say, in, in, the, in, the, in the north of Spain, the payments going out and in would go through the correspondent bank in London, so that our banks would not have relationships with small banks or even large banks in every town or city in every territory in the European Union. They would only deal with particular correspondent banks, and sometimes in one country alone. A lot of our banks deal with correspondent banks in London, and these correspondent banks then send money to France, to Germany, to Spain, and so on. So that if, for example, you had a child who was studying at a university in Toulouse, for example, which is in the south of France, and tuition payments were required, you would go to Republic Bank or Scotia Bank, Royal Bank as the case may be, arrange for the, the wire transfer, which would then be routed through the correspondent bank in London and arrive at the bank that the University of Toulouse, for example, would use in the south of France. The money can't go directly. It has to go through a correspondent bank because our banks here do not have relationships with every bank in the world. And similarly, coming the other way, if payments are to be made to, say, FCB in Port of Spain, they have to come through a correspondent bank in, in London or wherever the case may be. So this was clearly explained to us. And one of the defensive measures that European countries will be required to take if we don't pass this income tax bill is to cease corresponding banking relationships. So it means our businessmen will not be able to pay for raw materials and they'll not be able to receive payment for goods that they export. The same also applies to yeah. the same applies to cash notes. It's a little known fact that the US dollars that you get in the bank in Trinidad or the euro notes for that matter, they don't come from our central bank. They come from a correspondent bank overseas. So if FCB or Republic Bank requires US dollars notes for persons who wish to travel, who wish to pay for something on arrival in New York or wherever it is, those notes come from a correspondent bank in the European Union or in the United States, as the case may be. That is another defensive measure that can occur, where the banks would cease supplying Trinidad and Tobago banks with foreign currency notes. So you'll have a situation where our citizens will be unable to get foreign currency notes from banks here in Trinidad. Another thing, another defensive measure, is to suspend transactions with credit cards, because credit cards as well have to be routed through a correspondent bank. They don't go directly from FCB in Trinidad to Bank of Madrid or something like that. They go through a correspondent bank. So again, if our banks lose their correspondent relationships, credit card transactions both abroad and online would be suspended, Madam Speaker. Another very disturbing defensive measure that these European Union countries can take is suspension of money um, services, such as uh, Western Union and MoneyGram and so on. Those two would be unable to take place because those two have to go through correspondent banks. So this was explained to us very carefully that if we do not pass this income tax amendment bill. These are all the things that could happen. And the only way that our businessmen, I think it would be impossible for an ordinary citizen, but the only way our businessmen could get transfers of money going out or coming in to buy goods or to receive payment for goods exported is to go through a long 
convoluted system, either paying a lot more in terms of bank charges and so on, or having to go through several countries to get the payment in and to get the payment out, Madam Speaker. So all of this was explained to us. And what was explained to us as well, the correspondent banks will be required to do extreme due diligence on banks in Trinidad and Tobago if we are not compliant. And many correspondent banks will simply not bother. They will simply not bother because it is too expensive, it is too tedious, and many banks will just walk away and not even bother to do a business with banks in Trinidad and Tobago. And the, the few that remain will charge far more than they currently charge for the, for the service of providing transfers in and out, Madam Speaker. The Bankers Association said categorically that they had no problems whatsoever with the drafting or wording of the legislation. None whatsoever. And they approved of the, the same approach as in this bill, as in, as in the FATCA legislation, for the reciprocal exchange of information between competent tax authorities. The NAMLAC, the National Anti-Money Laundering Committee, made it clear that this bill has arisen because of deficiencies identified in the mutual evaluation report done by FATF on Trinidad and Tobago in 2016. And the key areas that FATF identified were FIU requirements, forms of international cooperation across sectors, including in particular law enforcement and effective legislation. They, they outlined again the consequences of non-passage of the bill. What, what we were told, and the head of the FIU said this, is that Trinidad and Tobago is currently on a gray list with FATF, and if this bill is not passed, we will move very swiftly to a blacklist. And the consequences of blacklisting with FATF are quite severe. The FIU also pointed out that money laundering is a crime that occurs after another crime has occurred. So you have a drug trafficker who wants to move money around, either to purchase or to sell drugs. After they've con completed their drug transaction, they have to find a way to move the money. And that is how money laundering comes into play. So money laundering in itself is illegal movement of money. But money laundering flows from very serious crimes, from human trafficking, from drug trafficking, from gun running, and from all other forms of very, very serious crimes. And they made the point that authorities all over the world, the world has changed. And if we do not comply with requirements for transparency and allowing law enforcement agencies access to information, then we will be deemed to be a country that is high risk. We're already high risk, higher risk, blacklist. And we would be deemed to be a country that other countries simply should not do business with. We'll become a pariah state. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service made the point that this bill will assist them in getting uh, easier access to information. And it is highly necessary, because if you're pursuing somebody, a money launderer, a drug trafficker, a human trafficker, a gun smuggler, if you're pursuing someone, a terrorist, you're pursuing somebody like that, time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. So the, the Chamber of Commerce endorsed the bill. They, they made the point that it will have a severe negative impact on trade, because they depend on correspondent banking services. They can't function without correspondent banking services. So if we don't pass this bill and correspondent banking services are withdrawn, then that's the end of them. And of course, the Board of Land Revenue endorsed the bill. The American Chamber endorsed the bill. I want to make that clear. The American Chamber of Commerce not only endorsed the bill, but said that this bill is easy to understand. That was a question posed directly by the Attorney General to the CEO of the Chamber, Mr. Nirad Tawari. He said, do you understand this bill? Because there's been some talk from members opposite that the bill is vague and um, un unambiguous. And Mr. Tawari said, no, he understands the bill. It's very clear. So that, yes. So in terms of the, the Eurocham TT, they sent in a, a written submission 
which simply reiterated the other issues. With respect to the other, other issues that we as a country have to deal with, I want to deal now with a very important point. One of the things that we are required to do as a country is to sign on and become a member of the Mutual Assistance Convention on Tax Matters. And there is a piece of legislation, Madam Speaker, that is not before us. Or let's put it another way. In order for Trinidad and Tobago to be a full member of the Mutual Assistance in Tax Matters Convention, we are required to sign on to a treaty. And that is the Mutual um, Assistance in Tax Matters Convention. In all our correspondence back and forth with the Global Forum, the questions coming from the European Union with respect to our readiness for accession to that treaty are very, very clear, Madam Speaker. The Global Forum has refused to allow Trinidad and Tobago to be invited to join the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Assistance, Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters. They don't believe that. They don't believe that. Madam Speaker, as far back as March 2017, as far back as March 2017, we received this email from the Secretariat in the OECD that deals specifically with tax matters. And the subject is your request to be invited to join the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Assistance, assist, Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters. And here is the questions coming from them. And this is to Ms. Amelia Swift, our tax treaty person at the time. Dear Ms. Swift, further to your request of 21st January 2017 to be invited to join the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters, MAC, as well as the related question on confidentiality, a couple of parties to the MAC, these are other countries, have come back to us with a request for further information. The issues raised are the following. The response to question one cites the Income Tax Act, Section 4. Excuse me, is there some device Him. on? Please continue. Yeah, yeah, all right. You be quiet now. The response to question one cites the Income Tax Act, Section 4, as the relevant statute requiring tax information to be kept confidential. Section 42A of the Income Tax Act appears to permit disclosure of confidential tax information to any person authorized by the president. The response to question 2B cites the Proceeds of Crime Act, which was attacked. It appears that under section 3, 32, 2, 3 and 11 of the Proceeds of Crime, a court may order the disclosure of information exchanged under a treaty or tax information exchange agreement for certain non-tax criminal uh, law enforcement purposes. Therefore, there appears to be a conflict between the confidentiality provisions in a treaty of tax information and several provisions of your domestic law. Can you provide a legal analysis explaining how, under your legal framework, the confidentiality obligations in treaties and tax information agreements will take over these and any other conflicting domestic laws. And that's the crux of the matter. The Mutual uh, Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Convention, which is a treaty, provides for automatic sharing of information between our Inland Revenue Division and other competent tax authorities in other countries. Once we sign that treaty, we have agreed that there will be automatic sharing of tax information from Trinidad and Tobago to the countries that are parties to that treaty and vice versa, just like FATCA. But what the European Union members were saying is that your income tax law has a secrecy provision in it. So even though you sign this treaty agreeing to share information automatically, 
your income tax law will be in conflict and it will make a nonsense of the whole thing. So what they told us is we will not allow Trinidad and Tobago to be invited. You first have to be invited to sign the treaty. And they refused to invite Trinidad and Tobago to sign the Mutual Administrative Assistance uh, on Tax Matters Treaty. Point blank refuse. Because, and the point they made, and I think this needs to be understood by all concerned, members opposite and the population. The point they made, we will not allow Trinidad and Tobago to sign this treaty with respect to mutual assistance in tax matters because your Income Tax Act has a secrecy provision which makes a nonsense of the treaty. So we won't allow you to sign on to this treaty until you go and fix your Income Tax Act and enact it into law and have it assented to. Because that's another point the Global Forum made, that they have no interest in legislation that is before the parliament, legislation that has passed through one house but not the other, legislation that has not been assented to and become part of our laws. In fact, they have refused to evaluate Trinidad and Tobago until we have this law enacted assented to and gazetted, Madam Speaker. And in all the correspondence, this is what the Global Forum is telling us. And they're telling us our commitment is insufficient. Our commitment is insufficient. When you look at the correspondence, which I will put into the record in due course, Madam Speaker, the Global Forum has been telling Trinidad and Tobago for quite a while now that our high-level political commitment is just not good enough. It's not just good enough to say that the bill is before a joint select committee or select committee, as the case may be. We're working on it. We're talking with the opposition about it. They are not interested in that. They have said point blank that until we pass this law and it becomes law, they, have no, they are not going to evaluate Trinidad and Tobago or allow us to sign the treaty, Madam Speaker. And, the, and, and all of the correspondence makes the point that what they require is automatic exchange of financial information, Madam Speaker. Listen to this. At a time, and this is a, this is a letter from this is a letter from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. And this is a March 31st, 2017 letter. And in this letter, they are telling, this is, this is from the OECD secretariat that deals with Mr. Mr. Ong, Onghel Gurria, is the person that sent it to us from the OECD. This is from the Office of the Secretary General of the OECD, telling us at a time when automatic exchange of financial account information has become the new international standard and in complement to the international standard on exchange on requests, the convention provides the ideal instrument to swiftly implement both standards. So the signing and ratification is, of the convention is very timely since Trinidad and Tobago has committed to start exchanging automatic, automatically financial account information later this year. So we were going down a pathway, Madam Speaker. We had written them, and we had said, if all goes in according to plan, we will have in our legislation the ability to automatically share tax information with the competent tax authorities in the OECD countries. But it never happened. It never happened. And here we are today, and it's still not happening. And what the Global Forum has told us is that until and unless we pass this law, they are not interested. They will not allow us to sign the treaty. They will not allow us to be part of the convention, and they will not do any fast track or any evaluation of Trinidad and Tobago. They say they can't help us. They say talk is cheap. If, if you say that you're going to deal with these matters, we don't want to hear that you have to pass the law, and then let us examine the law, and we will determine whether you are on the way. And this is all a work in progress, Madam Speaker. It's a work in progress. It's step by step. It's like you're climbing a ladder. They won't even let you get on the ladder to climb to the top, which is full compliance with the Global Forum, unless you fix your domestic law, in particular secrecy provisions and your income tax law. They won't let you get on the pathway to get towards compliance, Madam Speaker. So until and unless we pass this legislation, Madam Speaker, that's it. We stuck. And, and we continue to be non-compliant among 154 countries in the world that are members of the Global Forum. How, how much more time do I have, Madam Speaker? Your time is up at 2.50.
to win. Oh, I have lots of time, lots of time. Until, Madam Speaker, we deal with this problem here, which seems to be causing so much concern to members opposite, until we deal with it, we will not be allowed to even get on the pathway to compliance with the Global Forum. That's all right. Madam Speaker, we on this side have gone out of our way to accommodate the opposition. We have gone out of our way. In the, in the Joint Select Committee that looked at the three pieces of legislation, the facts became clear that you cannot incorporate into your domestic law the mutual assistance uh, ad in an administrative tax convention until you first become a member of that convention, Madam Speaker. The steps in, in, in terms of treaty obligations are first, you are eligible to sign the treaty. You are deemed to be eligible to sign the treaty. Then you are allowed to sign the treaty. Then, yes, the intergovernmental agreement. Then you have to ratify the treaty. And then you have to incorporate the treaty into your domestic law so it has force of law in your country. The, 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 the bill, the second bill of the three, that is not before us, that, that deals with the convention, presumes that we have already signed the treaty because we cannot incorporate a treaty into our domestic law until we are a member of that convention, Madam Speaker. So that bill will have to wait until we are allowed by the Global Forum to become a member of the MAC, exactly. to become a member of the Convention on, on Tax Matters. We are not, they will not allow us to be invited to be a member. They will not allow us to sign it. And therefore, the bill has to stay in abeyance until we are allowed to enter into the, the, the group of countries that have signed that treaty. So that bill could be before a thousand joint select committees. It will make no point because we can't, that, that law, if enacted, will be a nonsense. And the exchange is, is, is there. That's that one. And the, and the third one is a, uh, a generic tax information exchange agreement law, which is what we had brought to this house when we were dealing with FATCA. We brought a generic law that will allow us to enter into similar FATCA type arrangements with other countries of the world. And, really and members opposite said, no, no, do not ask us to pass any legislation that will allow you to have tax information agreements with other countries. We're only doing one, United States of America. So we had to then amend that legislation to make it focused only and applicable to only the United States of America. If they had, the, if members opposite had not insisted on that requirement, that would have been law in Trinidad and Tobago already, and we would already have done the third element the in all of this. Law was yes, the original law. The standing law the, since the, the, was generic. And, and, and the Attorney General is pointing out to me, the original tax information law was a generic law. Was in it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't specific to any particular country. But when we came with FATCA. They, gave, they put up so much resistance that they said, look, take out all these provisions that will allow you to enter into information sharing agreements with other countries and only re, um, uh, relate this bill to United States. But now we reach Global Forum. We have these three things to do. Pass the income tax amendment bill, remove the secrecy provision in the income tax law under certain prescribed conditions. That then allows us to sign the mutual administrative um, convention on tax matters, that signature of that then allows us to come to Parliament and enact law. The, the law incorporating the convention into our law. And then we have the generic law, which has always been there, which they rejected when we brought this to the Parliament exactly. as part of the FATCA legislation. They already signaled a long time that they were rejecting the third element in the requirements from Global Forum. So I am saying all of this, Madam Speaker, because people need to know that there's no there's nothing complex about all of this. This is all very simple. The, the global forum countries have said, the EU has said, unless you adopt the international standard, which is the automatic sharing of tax information with competent tax authorities in other countries, unless you do that, you will become a para state. And they further said, until and unless you do that, adopt the global standard of automatic sharing of tax information, we won't allow you to become a member of the 
the, the mutual assistance um, convention on tax matters. And certainly, the other side has already told us that we had to go one by one by one. How many countries have in the world? 190 something. So, so the other side have told us that we had to have 190 debates as we go to Germany and we go to France and we go to to Argentina and we go to Brazil, we have to, we, that is what we were told on the last occasion, that we, when we did the FATCA debate, we were told, Madam Speaker, the noise has started up again. Honorable members, I would like to hear the Minister of Finance, please. I was speaking, you see, they don't want the people to know the truth. When we came with the FATCA legislation, they, it was a multi-purpose omnibus piece of legislation that would have made us globally compliant. And they say take out all those other references, all those other countries, and make this with the United States alone. And then we come back to Global Forum now, and Global Forum say, you see that shipping is all you do? Making that tax information exchange agreement one country, well, you had to make it all. Eh? So we know a whole year later, a whole year later, right back to square one where the parliament was a year ago, where we said we would like to pass a law that allows for the sharing of tax information with the other countries of the world. And they said, nah, just one, United States. And when you went to do the next one, come back with a single purpose bill just for that. 190 pieces of legislation we will have to do if, if they continue with that approach, Madam Speaker. So the other feature of this bill, which is a FATF requirement, and the AG has shown me that uh, the actual deadline for passing the income tax amendment bill, giving the police the ability to deal with tax information in limited matters, was the 22nd of November. Originally. I've, I have the correspondence here, and we'll circulate it to honorable members. It will be circulated, you don't believe us? I have heard some amazing tale sure. that the members opposite don't believe us, show us, well, I will show it to you, we'll send it to you, you could see it, read it for yourself. I'm sorry, Madam. Speaker. Yes, please. I know I'm not supposed to display. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get your permission. But we will, we will circulate it on September the 12th, 2018. Mr. The Honorable Stuart Young, Minister of National Security, received correspondence from the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force stating that. The deadline date is the 22nd of November. We're trying to be able to confirm the application for re-ratings of the relevant technical compliance measure. The Secretariat will, pursuant to par paragraph 90 of the CFATF mutual evaluation procedures, request the FUR to be submitted at least six months in, adva in advance of the May 2019 plenary meeting or on Thursday, November 22nd, 2018. That was eight days ago. Well, eight eight days an ago. And because they were refusing refusing to, to, to agree to the income tax amendment bill, the police provision, we missed this deadline. And we have requested from FATF a further deadline, and they gave us until today, the 30th of November, 2018, Madam Speaker. And the whole point is that in order to comply with the requirements of these world bodies, financial action task force and so on, there are dates you have to give them things in advance, the point being made in this letter that you have to provide information at least six months in advance of the May 2019 plenary meeting of the Financial Action Task Force. And six months was 22nd of November. So we passed, we, we, we not even compliant with the six months. But Madam Speaker, because of members, uh, things that they have raised opposite, if you look at the report of the committee, we have made further amendments to the contentious clause five of the bill. Further amendments to the contentious clause five of the bill, Madam Speaker. And with respect to the matter that is causing apprehension opposite, apprehension, I don't know why a clause like this could cause so much apprehension, but it's causing apprehension. And that is the clause that deals with the um, giving the power to the police to access tax information. We have made... We have made amendments, Madam Speaker. Further amendments, in, 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 and this is based on correspondence sent to me by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, uh, arising from correspondence that I sent to the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. And we have amended the section that deals with a written law, 
and we've tightened it up now so that that power of the police officer to get, to seek an order of the court to access taxpayer information will be limited to proceeds of crime, matters dealing with proceeds of crime, terrorist financing, and fraud, serious fraud dishonesty. or dishonesty. So it is no longer a cost case or a foul thief case. But we have, we have, we have, it, it no we have, it never was. Madam Speaker. Members, members, I would like us all to observe standing order 53 as regards members who are not speaking. Please contain your volumes. Minister Finance. Madam Speaker, I'm advised by parliamentary council that when you read the chapeau to clause five, together with the choisir, the choisir to clause five, it makes it very clear that those powers of the police officer were limited to matters dealing, flowing from the proceeds of crime and so on. But we decided to make, make the English clear. language crystal clear. So we have an amendment. Yes, we have made an amendment to the legislation for those who don't agree that the chapeau and the chasseur of a clause are the governing uh, elements of a clause so for, for the purpose of interpretation. So we have made it clear now that is, it is shwasu. It is the proceeds of crime, terrorist financing, and matters of fraud and dishonesty. It, it is now crystal clear. So this argument about how we're trying to harass people and that the police, we, we want to give the police um, powers to go and get tax information if somebody is involved in a, in a petty offense, Madam Speaker. That is now out the window. And, and with respect to the evidentiary test, the question of the level of evidence, I'm advised that's already in the common law. Because you go, the police officer will have to satisfy a judge Correct. that he has reached the evidentiary threshold in order for the judge to order that the, the disclosure of tax information. The way the clause is written, it must be based on an order of a judge. The policeman just can't go to the Inland Revenue Department and grab the information. He must go to a judge who will, sati who will be satisfied that the, the evidentiary threshold has been reached for the granting of the order. And if that is something as well, if you want to tighten up the language and, and use things like an arguable case or whatever, we are, we are amenable to look at things like that. So, Madam Speaker. But that is fraught with danger as well. I'm advised by the Attorney General, because Fatif has said the language in the proceeds of crime, which uses language like reasonable cause and so on, is out. Fatif has said definitively, when you put those kind of words into legislation, that you are in breach of the Financial Action Task Force requirements. So, Madam Speaker, I think I have made it, I think I have made it very clear that if we don't pass this income tax amendment bill, crap will smoke we pipe. Soon there'll be no Western Union, no MoneyGram, no credit card, no wire transfer, no foreign currency notes in Trinidad and Tobago. That is what's gonna happen if we don't pass this income tax amendment bill. I think I've made it clear that we have bent over backwards to facilitate the opposition. We've put in judicial oversight and we have tightened up the language to deal with the um, the, the whole question of any written law. And I want to make one final commitment on behalf of the government. The other matters which are not before us are before another joint committee, select committee, which is why they're not on the order paper. And when I made the point that those other bills are not on the order paper, I was very crystal clear. I said the other bills are not on the order paper. They, they are still not on the order paper and not before the House. They are before a joint select committee, which was approved unanimously by members opposite. If you check the Hansard, honorable members opposite unanimously agreed that the other two bills, the mutual assistance in tax matters and the information agree exchange agreements should go to a joint select committee on their own. Members opposite agreed to that, Chief and those other matters are before another committee. But I give a commitment on behalf of the government that we will 
reactivate that committee. It has to be populated with members, the new independent senators who have come on board. It has to be repopulated. I will, re I will ask the parliament to re-establish and reconstitute that committee to, to, to take note of the fact that we have a different independent bench now. The, the committee was populated with others. And reconstituted over the coming week, starting today, going down to next week, Friday, repopulated and start the first meeting of that committee on the 10th of December to report back to this House by the 17th of December on the other two matters, Madam Speaker. And with those few words, I beg to move. Honourable Members, I will now propose a question for debate. Be it resolved that this House adopt the report of the Special Select Committee of the House of Representatives on the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2018. Member for Naparima. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am a bit confused listening to the member for Digo Martin Northeast because he says one thing and then on another occasion he utters something entirely different. And I would like to believe that when somebody says yea, they mean yea, and when they say nay, they mean nay. It was at the first meeting of the Joint Select Committee on this bill, on this bill income tax. the Income Tax Amendment Bill, where the self same member for Digo Martin Northeast, he said, and I'm quoting here, and it is resp in response to a question from the member for Port of Spain South. She said, she said, she asked him, we would be doing which one, or are we going to take all the three bills? And this chairman, the member for Digo Martin Northeast, responded, we have to do all three. All three bills have been referred to this committee. And Ms. McDonald sought clarification. The Honorable, I, I, I apologize. The Honorable Member for Port of Spain South sought clarification. She said, together. And the, and the Member for Digo Martin Northeast said, and they are all interrelated. Interrelated. Interrelated, as far as I understand, mean they are connected. They one affects the other, and it would be better if we review them collectively. That is my understanding of what he said then. But today he comes and says one bill alone we should check. But you see, that is not all, Madam Speaker. You see, we 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 not sure when he tells us that he's serious, whether he's serious or not. And he's very convincing. But I quote him again. He says, I, I, I've set a short deadline, and I'll come to the question of deadlines later on, and, and the shifting deadlines. And why all we want to do is to find out what are the facts, what are our requirements, and let us work together to make it happen. He said, I have set a very short deadline to show the EU and the Global Forum that we're serious. He said it is unlikely that we would meet the deadline by the end of June. Remember. Remember. I mean, we have this procedural thing to do, and so on. I figure we would not do it by the end of June, probably even by September, October, but it doesn't matter. He's talking serious things and telling us, yeah, I set deadlines, but it does not matter. He says, I want to get in and let them see that we are doing something. So you come here today and tell us deadlines. The country is, is, is put in a panic mode by deadlines. And all we say, Ms. the member for Digo Martin or, or Northeast, what are the deadlines? And when are we required to fulfill these respective deadlines to come off the list? Because we all want to come off the list too. But the question is, the question is, we cannot, we cannot into a trust this minister and the deadlines that he gave. Madam Speaker, this, our Minister of Finance wrote, and I, and I said this before, but it's, it, it is worth repeating, to understand the depth of deceit, the depth of misunderstanding. Sorry, I would draw the word depth of misdirection that we are subjected to. Misinformation, I'm corrected by the member for Sipara. Thanks very much. Misinformation. The, minister, the member for Digo Martin Northeast 
wrote, wrote the, 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 the code, chairman of the Code of Conduct on 21st uh, November 2017, and there he gave, the, the member gave deadlines, again, that had no specific meaning. He wrote and committed Trinidad and Tobago to the passage of five bills, and here are the deadlines. And here is the problem we have with deadlines. Honorable so, uh, um, member, I think I understood your point about deadlines as far as this, and you went back beyond the, bill, uh, the report that is before us. And I, I would have allowed that based on something that the uh, minister said in moving the bill. I am not going to allow you to develop carte blanche and issue about deadlines. So if this matter you're referring to goes outside of this, I'm not going to allow it. OK? Madam Speaker, I assure you it does not go outside. Because we are told today that if we do not pass this bill today, the heavens will fall. That is what we are told today. But, but, but you see, you see, Madam Speaker, the deadline has shifted because we, we are told it was the end of November. And then we are told it is the 31st of December in this letter. And today, in our meeting with the Prime Minister, we were told that we have to do these things in time for some meeting in January or February next year, and we have to show compliance. So I, I left that meeting today confused as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. What am I doing today, and where does this fit in in the generality of requirements that we have to fulfill? Fulfill, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, another a, a significant problem that we have on this side is why it is the members from the other side seem deadly opposed to doing the three bills that we were committed to and which they wrote the, the EU and said that we would, um, we would meet. Why are they not in fact, in fact, Madam Speaker, is disrespect to the opposition. Because we have said on diverse occasions, we have said in the minority report that we would like to come off the, the EU, the, the blacklist. And to do that, we are prepared to work 24-7, night and day, with a tight deadline to get these three bills passed before this House. And if they say that one bill is sufficient, one bill is sufficient, would three bills not be more than adequate to deal with their circumstances, Madam Speaker? Why this fear of working hard in the people's interest to get these bills out of the thing? But you see, Madam Speaker, we do not wish to, we, we have a fat, had a FATCA situation, we debated. We come today and we debate this bill and, 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 and we spend time going, going over the pro, all the difficulties with this income tax amendment bill. We, we, did, did, we have the double taxation agreements bill to deal with. We have the companies amendment bill in 2017. We have the mutual administration assistance in tax matters bill 2017. And we have the BEPS inclusive framework legislation. For heaven's sake, why can't we sit down and, and deal with all these bills, all the legislation, bill, bill, bring one complete package to the parliament so that we get rid of this issue once and for all? And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we knew about this a long time ago. We knew about the 20, we knew this since 2015. For heaven's sake, 2016, 2017, we went for a fast track review and we failed. And the entirety of 2018, and Madam Speaker, late in the night, 24 hours I had, Madam Speaker, 24 hours to, di to digest, analyze, and represent the people of Naparima uh, positively and this legislation. 12 hours. Madam Speaker, 12 hours? 12 hours. How many pages? How many pages? 96, 96 pages. 
Look, I've seen 94 pages, probably one miss. 94 pages in 24 hours, and, and in 12 hours. And we are saying that we want to be like Singapore, like a first world country, that when we bring legislation to this parliament, it has the in intelligence, it has the inputs, it has the, 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 the ideas from a vast variety of people. I have, I have members of Naparima, lawyers, doctors, engineers, who very, and businessmen, who are very much interested in this legislation. But by the time I got this legislation, it was midnight. I got up in the morning, 6 o'clock. It was only six hours I passed it for them to have a look at. Today, I was just getting comments from my constituents. This is not the way we run a country in the 21st century, Madam Speaker. This is not the way. This is what we call slothfulness. This is laziness. This is dealing with things at the last moment. This is crisis management. And today, Madam Speaker, what we are witnessing today what we're witnessing today is organized chaos. Organized chaos. What we, these, these like, like, and I don't want to bring the Galicia into that. Manufacture a crisis, give us something at the last moment, run to the population and say, you see those on this side, they're not prepared. They, we are saboteurs, we are told. We are told we are saboteurs. When all we want to do is be right by the oath which we took here, which is to be do the best that we could. Madam Speaker, I cannot do the best. I'll be honest with you. I cannot read 95 pages and make intelligent contributions on something that affects the, my society. There are changes in here that require a legal input. And I would be talking to my, my senior counsels to get information as to how, what to present. But you cannot get that from this uh, uh, administration. Cannot get that from this administration. Why? We ask on this side, is this penchant with deadlines on that side? And why don't we not so organize our business? This is management studies here. Why don't we not organize our business in such a manner that we could have um, ve proper ventilation of the ideas and the, and the issues that are raised in this? But you know, Madam Speaker, do you know the real reason why we are here today? It is because today is a day of darkness in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. It is a day when the lights are no longer shining on Petro Trin, which is the icon of our, of our, our thrust to become a first world country. I'll be only one line on this. The flames, it, 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 the flames have, di have died, and they were looking for destruction. They're looking for destruction. What we have today is organized chaos in the form of a deadline that we are not sure. Madam Speaker, I asked a moving deadline. I asked in the Joint Select Committee. The, the, the member for Digo Martin Nortis keeps saying that we agreed to, to, to deal with one bill. Doing the report of the Special Select Committee. I've allowed you a big introduction Okay, I've allowed you a big introduction. We're not going back to the report of the Joint Select Committee. What is before us is the report of the Special yes, Select Committee. Yes, Madam Speaker, right. but the member for Digo Martin Ortiz made reference to the point in his presentation that we all agreed to deal with one bill. He and he said that today, I heard it, and I could hear. Madam Speaker, we agreed, we did not agree. In fact, it was in the air. We do not have a majority. But the point is, we asked, we asked, and, and if we had agreed at all, it would have been on a, an indication from the EU that if we pass this one bill, it would get us off the blacklist. We have not received that. Today, we are, we are told of some email, some something in the ether existing somewhere that he will circulate to all of us. We have not seen it. It will probably come 12 o'clock in the morning when we're sleeping so that we may not look at the details of, 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 of that. Okay. Madam Speaker, the founding father of this nation spoke about the need for the opposition and the government to consult 
and interact with each, with each other in order to get be better legislation. But that is dependent on respect, mutual respect. You cannot treat, you cannot treat with individuals if you do not at least accept that they have something to say of value. This government does not accept that we have anything to say of value. Madam Speaker, my political leader wrote the, 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 the Minister of Finance on the 22nd of November 2018. Madam Speaker, critical in that letter is her statement that we, this legislation ought to be uh, 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 brought to a joint select committee to, to be discussed together. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, up to today, they have not acknowledged that aspect of the letter. The most significant, they want to go to Clause 5, they want to go to Clause 6, but the major point, they do not want to acknowledge. Madam Speaker, I want to, I want to indicate some of the points that we were concerned about in, that, in, that, uh, in, in our letter to the government. The mishandling of the legislative process. The lack of st proper stakeholder consultations. They did hold stakeholder uh, 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 consultations after we raised the, matter. raised the matter. Kicking and screaming, they acknowledge. And I have some concerns. When I look at the line of questioning, leading questions, asking questions in terms of what would be the outcome if we do not meet the EU requirements. And, and of course, the EU requires, of course, it would be problems for corresponding bank relationships. Because I would like to hear the member for Naparima, and the same way I interrupted for the member for Digo Martin Northeast, I am going to interrupt for every member if I'm getting difficulty to hear. Member for Naparima. Madam Speaker, kicking and screaming, we had to get consultation. And belatedly, they came to the conclusion that it would have helped. Why, why our, when we first mooted this idea, in, in, why was it not accepted? Why only after, after the fact? It's like FATCA legislation. After the fact, we made amendments, which they admitted improved it significantly. If they had respect for us, a lot of, we, Madam Speaker, we have been here since, when was the time we first came to this, uh, this first bill? And I, we came in June, in June, in May, Madam Speaker, in May. June 2018. All right, I, I, I say in May 25th, and in June 29th, yeah, there was the interim report. The final report was presented in September 17. Madam Speaker, in that, 17, in that 17, September 17 report, we had a minority report which spoke to our concerns. Up to today, our concern, primarily in respect of the three bits of legislation, have not been addressed. And Madam Speaker, from that time to today, two months, two months, we could have met, and today we would have been discussing how we come off the list. We would have had all the legislation discussed, and we were prepared to give a commitment so to do. But for some reason, some reason, this government seems to operate in chaos. If we say we, will want, we wish to pass all five bills, let us meet and discuss. For some reason, they want us to go through this chaotic process on five occasions, which cannot and, 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 and present the things in a rush manner to you. Madam Speaker, any consultations? And I'll speak about Amcham. The Select Committee. The Select Committee, which, which, which Madam Speaker, is not the best way to get the best legislation. It is not the best way. But this government is not committed to the best way at all. Amcham said the three bills should be considered together. When I look at all and most of them, it's on page 13, right? They talk about the need for judicial supervision. And yes, they said the bill was clear and unambiguous. But they also said it should be considered together. And when you read uh, um, a number of uh, the EU, they are saying they out outlined, the, they talked about, EU explained the main driver behind the tax trans transparency standard. And the EU and the global in interest in tax transparency. We have, we have no problem. What did no one, no one whom they consulted said that there was any downside 
to looking at the three bills simultaneously and presenting it as, an, uh, as, as combined legislation before this House. None of them said that. But all of them would only wish for us is to, to look at the legislation from their perspective. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, you see, there is something that comes with, with, with age, where time is important. Because you recognize there's not, a, there's not a, 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 an expansive a, a situation where you can delay things forever. If we have to do something, the, the easy people at my age, we say, what is the shortcut to get the same output? What do I need to do? Do I need to run down the road and run back? My grandson, if you tell him, go and pick up something here, he picks up a speed at 100 miles an hour. He goes towards it, he mashes our brakes, and he, and he repeats the process. When you get a little older, you think about what is the process, the best, to, uh, best process to achieve the outputs that you desire. And we are saying, how, the, what is the output? We want to get out of the blacklist. That is all. That is their goal. That is our goal and the goal of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. The question we ask, it, uh, what we are doing today, is this a piecemeal approach? Is this 10 percent to the output? Or should we not be dealing cumulatively with the suggestion that we raise, let us reason together and let us come with the legislation before this House, get this thing out of the way and get on to the next issue. This country has problems, challenges. We cannot afford to come five times to deal with one output, which is to get off the blacklist. Come one time, let us argue and, and do what we have to do. And then, we, after we do that, we move on and make Trinidad and Tobago the country we wish it to be. So our letter raised some concerns. A general unwillingness by the government to share information. And speaker, it is like pulling teeth from this government. There's always something in somewhere, some email that you will see in, the, in, in some time in the future. What, but which is not brought before you so we can make an informed decision. Madam Speaker, if, and you said you don't want to go in the Joint Select Committee, but if at the Joint Select Committee we were presented with a written statement from the EU saying if we pass this bill, it will get us off the blacklist, today this bill would have been passed a long time ago. It would not have reached this stage today. Because it's all basically one point, and I think the point has been made to move on to your next point, please. Whoever. Whatever. Whoever. Whatever. Whatever. Madam Speaker, Bring the Madam Speaker, the points I'm raising are the points that we are our concerns about this bill today. And had they been addressed today, we could have, when we met the Prime Minister, we could have had a very fruitful outputs-oriented um, discussion. We raised the question of, and, and, and you see, Madam Speaker, you, I, I've been told that the fact that they have not shared the information with us is irrelevant. It is not. If the information was shared with us, if that email from the EU or the OECD or FATF, which says that if we pass this bill today, it would get us off the list, why, we would not be here. We would not be wasting time, but we have not seen it. We are here today, and we are told that we cannot raise the question. Yeah. And, and that speaks to a fundamental point. We do not trust them on that side. We do not believe what they say. They are about politics and gaining um, public acceptance by demonizing anybody who does not support them uncritically. Anybody who has a different view. It, it, it says, um, further checks have revealed that the government has not committed to any deadline for passage of legislation. The conclusion of the Code of uh, Conduct Group 5 December says that Trinidad and Tobago has not signed and ratified the OECD Multilateral Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters. And, Madam Speaker, if we pass this legislation, they say, we cannot provide the information to the EU or to the OECD or to internal part, external parties. This legislation deals specifically with giving the executive ex a significant overreach into tax uh, 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 information relating to all citizens. This bit of legislation, all citizens. Madam Speaker, let's think about it. 
if I have a contract with Petrotrin or with Paria, what's the new company? Heritage Company. And I'm being paid a million dollars. No, I don't get that kind of money. Right? My, my, if you look at my account, I would like them to look at my tax account and my bank account. I'll make it available. They will give me a donation. <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> if I am getting a contract with Petrotrin, and this is information could be readily accessed by anyone, including those opposite, and, and don't tell me about 100,000 um, liability for, for some. These things could be done. This is Trinidad. And if, if they get my information, could they not call Petrotrin as a state enterprise and say, I want you to terminate that contract with Rodney Charles? I, I'm not saying they will do that. But it could be done by somebody who is operating at that level in, in, who has access to that information. And that the point is, oh, the, the framers of our constitution, uh -huh. the framers of our, including a former member for Naparima, Sir Lionel F. Sukaran, who, who introduced clauses that would protect the citizenry from executive overreach. But as they say, the framers of the Constitution worked it in such a way that in order to infringe any of these fundamental entrenched constitutional rights, there had to be discussion. Madam Speaker, we are here today. We are saying on this side of the opposition, we are saying to Trinidad and Tobago, we are prepared to pass good legislation any day. We are prepared to, to meet our international commitments. We are prepared. But we're also saying that there are competing interests, our obligations externally, and our rights, and our obligations to our citizenry. And in that balance of give and take, that nuancing of the legislation, it requires that this bill, together with the two other bills, in fact, Madam Speaker, we are saying not only the three bills, not only the three bills, but every bit of legislation that is required to get us off the, to get us off the, the, the EU blacklist and the OECD. We are prepared to deal with that. But you see, we on this side are not lazy. I could say that. We on this side are prepared to work night and day in the people's interests. What, what, Madam Speaker, and I challenge those on the other side, bring all the legislation, and if you can't bring all, bring the three pieces of legislation. We are prepared to give a commitment to Trinidad and Tobago here today that within 10 days, 10 working days, we could come to this parliament with the, with the three bits of legislation and get us off the list. Thank you. Madam Speaker, it is, as, as somebody new to this legislation, well, I've been here two and a half years. Um, we, the, one of the, what the, the, the so, ask you, I'm a bit confused what legislation you're talking about. Are you talking about the legislation as it is in this report? Okay, because I think that there are certain amendments and so in this report. So when you're talking about the legislation, I'm not sure what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. And what is before us is what is here. My two years in the legislature. Uh -huh. But with respect to the legislation before us, I, I, would, I would close, I would close by imploring the government, I will close by imploring the government to be willing, be humble, be understanding that there are various views and all views have validity. It is part of the the greatness of having a diversity as, as opposed to one set of views. There are going to be various views which have to be taken on board, if only to get better legislation. So, Madam Speaker, when you hear comments like, we are being recalcitrant, recalcitrant, which brings up, brings up memories of yesteryear that created problems in the, in the, polit in the polity of this country. When we hear that, we feel that we are disrespected. I, 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 I would close, I would close by saying, people like myself, there's another generation of politicians coming to Trinidad and Tobago. They're in the form of young senators, 
Madam Speaker. And when I heard a young senator, six foot tall, dark as they come, from rural Trinidad and Tobago, being addressed as little boy, sit down, I close by saying that that Member. is irresponsible. Member. Member for Santos Fernando. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Madam Speaker, the last speaker, the Honorable Member for Naparima. Full of decibels. Full of decibels, as his presentation was, had me searching for content otherwise, had one thing true to say, in my opinion. He said that this was organized chaos. And I want to agree that the approach taken by my learned friends, by the opposition, under the leadership of the member for Separia, is organized chaos. Madam Speaker, let's dive to the heart of this. The member for Naparima has stood up to say that the government somehow is lazy, slothful, that they needed to come here and do work in the manner that the honorable member said that they would do. Naparima said that they would come here and work night and day. This coming from the same member who sits in an entire team of members who refuse to come to the special select committee appointed by this house at their request to come and do the people's work. Madam Speaker, it is amplified by the position that there was, according to the member in reading the letter from Mrs. Passard Bicessa, the leader of the opposition, to the Minister of Finance, they had some problems with the legislative process and management. Madam Speaker, this bill was laid in this house on the 25th of May 2018. We stand today on the 30th of November, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Tomorrow is the 1st of December. And the honorable member has the temerity to volunteer the submission that this bill needed more time, Madam Speaker. Coming from the members of the opposition who refused to meet over the long period vacation yes. for the months of July, August, until we were compelled with the restart on the 14th of September, the honorable members opposite refused to participate in the joint select committees that this government had and this parliament had arranged. So that's the example of hard work UNC style. That's the example of hard work, Naparima style. You see, that's why I said full of decibels and hard to find content. Madam Speaker, the honorable member spent his entire time and didn't address a single clause in the bill. Not one. The bill has 10 clauses, Madam Speaker, 10 clauses. In the 10 clauses, four of them are what you call nothing, essentially. Long title, short title, this act shall mean the Income Tax Act, etc. Five of the other clauses are a cut and paste formula from the FATCA legislation. One clause was left, but the Honorable Member comes here and says, today is a dark day, the lights are off. The government's strategy, according to the member, in organized chaos, according to the member, was to have this debate today because we somehow knew that this debate was going to happen on the closing date for Petrotrin. So strong was that honorable member's submission that he failed to recognize that they put in a minority report in writing, which was debated in this house on the 2nd of November, 2018. And the, one thing that was not there. and the one thing that certainly was not there was the submission that we designed this organized chaos to have this debate somehow knowing that the UNC would have us here on the 30th of November the same day. I mean, that is a wild fantasy that is beyond measure. But only Naparima could come up with that. Three bill was not in the minority. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member also said that we had to have three bills. The Honorable Member has said that there's no reason for not having these three bills. The Minister of Finance stood here 
for his entire contribution explaining. Bill number one, the Income Tax Amendment Bill, is a requirement of two entities, the Financial Action Task Force, the Global Forum. Those two entities have deadline dates. On the first hand, with the Financial Action Task Force, the process in writing as read out by the Minister of Finance required us to do a post-observation reporting, a request for re-ratings today, November 30th, by way of an extension of the November 22nd deadline. The Honourable Member says he was confused after the meeting with the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister today, saying he can't understand deadline date, and I, I don't understand, and I don't understand, in, in this bumbling, confused sort of manner of expression, of logic. And the Honourable Member says that he can't follow, that in January you have a step, and in February you have a step. Let me put it on the record again, because it's not the first time I'm doing it. The Financial Action Task Force engages in peer reviews. They're called mutual evaluation reviews. They engage in a report. They evaluate you. We were evaluated for fourth round in January 2015 by the UNC, committing us to that. The report was laid in 2016, June. 2016, 2017, 2018 are the three periods of follow-up reporting because they put you in a monitoring process and say you have to take steps to take yourself out of non-compliance as against a category they call immediate outcomes and another category they call the 40 recommendations. You have to report on a continuous basis. Tell them with respect to this and that, I'm going to take the following step. The reporting period is due According to the letter read by the Minister of Finance, it was originally on the 22nd of November. It was extended to today's date. The meeting is to be held in January face to face. The plenary session is in February. It's at the plenary where they decide, have you completed what you said? But Naparima, for the life of him, for the life of his own sustenance, cannot understand that that international obligations require follow-up. Naparima, who says, we must be like a first world country, we must commit to a process like Singapore, Naparima can't understand that. So, Madam Speaker, they asked for a deadline, they got it. That's on FATF. With respect to the Global Forum, the Minister of Finance was pellucidly clear. The other legislation, without breaching the rule of anticipation, is the Multilateral Treaty Entry and the Tax Information Exchange Act. The Minister of Finance already explained that the Tax Information Act, to do that exchange of information, is FATCA on a cut and paste model to allow you a general mechanism of explaining how you're going to exchange information. On the Mutual Assistance Treaty, you cannot sign the treaty which is a part of the bill. The bill is explanatory framework clauses, and it has a treaty attached to it. That is what the Joint Select Committee is being asked to consider on that. You cannot consider the treaty because you haven't signed it. Exactly. So you can't consider the bill because you haven't signed the treaty which is attached to the bill. But Naparima cannot understand that. Bo, sir, Karani Central, the Honourable Member, Dr. Tiwari, the member for Karani Central, sat in this parliament as a member of the NAR government, passed the intergovernmental inter agreement arrangements for the United States in 1989 under a general model tax information exchange law. That Honourable Member then participated in a parliament that passed that law. Sitting in the UNC, many years later, last year, in the FATCA debate, the honorable member agreed with his bench and said, we're not going to have any more general law. I stood and reminded the country and the opposition that we required the general law for global forum. I said it then, I say it now. 
So we cannot get to dealing with another bill without a treaty. FATCA, we debated because we had signed the intergovernmental exactly. agreement. So, Madam Speaker, the honorable members opposite have had their deadline dates. They have had their joint select committee request asked, answered by having a committee in the period June to November. A second committee request, we had a special select committee. The members of the opposition refused to participate in the committee. And Naparima stands up today asking us to have pity for him supposedly in having 12 hours to read the report that we're debating now. But honorable member, if you had bothered to come and do the work of the parliament by attending at the committee, you would not have had 12 hours. You would have been a member of the committee doing the work that you're receiving a salary to do. So what are you saying? Most respectfully, honorable member, you fail to turn up and you complain when you get it. Which is it, madam speaker? And we work non-stop, you know. I'll work non-stop, but I'm not coming to work. I will read, but I'm not coming to the committee that will write the report. I mean, that's Naparima's express logic on the floor of this house, you know. That is what the first responder to the Minister of Finance had to say. Not even senior counsel, Siparia, has stood up in this debate. One would think that the leader of the opposition would be the first responder. Anyway, Madam Speaker, let's get on to the law. The law which we propose to come before this parliament is built on the back of stakeholder consultation prior to the first joint select committee, during the process of government operating, and most importantly, Madam Speaker, it was brought about by something which Naparima didn't have the courage to admit. The Global Forum came to Trinidad and Tobago and met with the opposition and informed them in the meetings that the law was required. But Naparima obviously cannot remember that. Neither me. Any contribution from, from point of view. So, Madam Speaker, in coming through this process, there's been an untruth as to consultation. Madam Speaker, the opposition has said nothing in relation to comments on the bill. But Madam Speaker, let me tell you who has given comments on the bill. The following entities have given comments on the bill as contained in this report. The Eurocham TT has said they have no issue with the bill. It requires effectively in their communication no form of amendment required by way of their letter dated 28th November 2018, which is part of the considerations of the Special Select Committee. The Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago has supported the passage of this law. The Financial Intelligence Unit, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service through the Financial Investigation Branch, the National Anti-Money Laundering Committee, which includes law enforcement, including the Director of Public Prosecutions, the American Chamber of Commerce, the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Commerce, the entire Banking Association of Trinidad and Tobago have all said to us that they want this law to pass without amendment. In fact, the representative for the American Chamber of Commerce was absolutely clear, and it's in the verbatim, in saying that the bill itself is unambiguous and requires no work and no amendment. In the verbatim reports, you will find that attached to this, to this report. So, Madam Speaker, somehow, somewhere, in trying to pick sense out of the UNC submission, I have yet to understand what is the problem with the bill. So let's go to the bill. Madam Speaker, we took very careful note to include in this report Appendix 2. Appendix 2 is to be found at page 97, and I want Naparima to hear this. Madam Speaker, the only clause that the UNC has pointed to as being problematic is in fact the clause for the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to receive taxpaying information. But Appendix 2 attached to this report does a very important thing, and I want all members to understand this. 
it sets out what in the bill requires a three-fifths majority. And I will traverse that now. Clause 1 requires no three-fifths majority. Clause 2 requires no three-fifths majority because it's just the expression that you need to have a three-fifths majority if, in fact, you use one. Clause 3, this act means the Income Tax Act, requires no special majority. Clause 4 is the amendment of the long title. It requires no special majority. Clause 5, this is the one. Section 4 is amended by removing, firstly, 2A, which is the power of the president to interfere with tax exchange. That's how no special majority required. Here this, subsection 4. Subsections 1 and 2, that's the secrecy provisions, do not apply in respect of criminal proceedings, either on indictment or summary conviction, hear this, that have been commenced. You know what that means? No special majority, because a court has an inherent power to compel the evidence by due process. No special majority. Subsection 5, notwithstanding subsections 1 and 2, where a written law authorizes disclosure, the board, et cetera, et cetera, may do so. You know what that means, Madam Speaker? No special majority, because a written law would have to have been passed with a special majority or be pre-1962 where it was not required. So subclause 5 requires no special majority. Hear this one. And a few people might get sick when they hear this one. Subclause 6. First part, notwithstanding, this is the chassure, this is the opposite of the chassure, this is the chapeau. For those who don't know, a chapeau means a hat in French. It is the legislative description to the first part of a clause. The chapeau says, notwithstanding subsections one and two, a person having an official duty or being employed in administration of this act shall, for the purposes of subsection five, I just referred you to the fact that subsection 5 requires no special majority. It goes on. A, basically you're providing it to the FIU. The FIU is already authorized under the FIU Act, having been passed with a special majority to receive information. So you need no special majority. Now, Naparima, I hope, will not get too upset when he hears this one. Subsection B, this is the big one the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Provide taxpayer information to a member of the police above the rank of superintendent for the purposes of investigating financial investigations or fraud solely for the purpose of investigating whether there's been offenses under poker, anti-terrorism, etc. Madam Speaker, the government has already said arising out of the only sensible thing that we got from the opposition, which is the minority report in the JSC, which we debated on November 2nd, we've said we'll introduce a judicial step here. But Madam Speaker, we require no special majority to do that. None. Subclause 7, where the taxpayer information disclosed under this section discloses an offense the taxpayer information may be used in evidence. No special majority required. Subclause 8, if a foreign country gives you taxpayer information, you can receive it. No special majority required, because it's coming from a foreign jurisdiction. Now, clauses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. These require special majorities. But Madam Speaker, listen to this. Subclauses 6, and some of it can be disaggregated to be kept with no special majority. 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are all word for word conceptually from the FATCA bill which the opposition agreed to. So, Madam Speaker, the thing which they're tripping over and complaining about as requiring special majority does not require it. The big issue is the police. We need the police. If we put in the judicial authorization, we satisfy proportionality within the concept of Baroness Hale's argument in Surat, 
We meet with proportionality within the context of the Constitution itself. So, Madam Speaker, you take that off the table. What's left on the table that does require a special majority is only what we have already agreed to for FATCA. It's worse than that, Madam Speaker. Part of this law is just a technicality, and let me explain why. When you look to Clause 8 of the bill, this act is amended after Section 93. Listen to this, 93A1. Notwithstanding Section 6, 38, and 40 of the Data Protection Act, it goes on to also mention Sections um, 6, 30, and 31 of the Data Protection Act and Section 93. Madam Speaker, take a guess what? The Data Protection Act, Chapter 2204, by Act of Parliament, 13 of number of 2011. The proclamation for that act reads as follows. The proclamation happened, Madam Speaker, on the 5th of January 2012. The UNC proclaimed the act partially. Listen to the sections that are actually proclaimed. 7 to 18, 22, 23, 25, 1, 26, and 28. In other words, Section 6, Section 38, Section 40, and Section 93, and Section 31 are irrelevant because they're not law. But we have to include it because it's part of law which is contemplated to come onto the books. But in effect, it's not required. It may be required if you consider Section 4A of the Constitution when you're talking about the right to privacy, private life. But Madam Speaker, I'm going to summarize the UNC's nonsensical argument as follows. The reply to that I will give as well. The UNC's argument is we need a joint select committee. We need more time. We need to have three bills looked at. Or five. Or five, or six, or ten. We need to make sure that we pass the multilateral convention law, even though the treaty is not in existence because you can't sign the treaty until it dismantles the secrecy provisions. We need, according to the UNC, to sit down and do work in some kind of fashion where they actually turn up to do the work. Because they've said that they will come and work night and day and then stay home and then boycott and not give names. They then say in their minority report and in the letters coming from the leader of the opposition, big problem. No Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. You need a judicial step. We've addressed that. The fact is you don't need a three-fifths majority to do that. So, Madam Speaker, we are facing two international bodies. One is the request for re-ratings due today for the Financial Action Task Force in writing. The next one is to address the OECD and let me explain to the Honorable Member for Naparima, the EU does not regulate the global forum. The Honorable Member for Naparima, having sat down on this piece of law as a member of parliament, being paid as a member of parliament to turn up here, does not know today, between May to now, the Honorable Member does not know that the EU does not regulate the global forum. He doesn't know that. And we must trust the Honourable Member, to do the work of the people. It is the OECD and that does and the and regulations. The report to G20 leaders comes from the OECD Secretary General. It was published in writing. In that report, at page 32, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows. In the seven rows, they deal with countries that are compliant, non-compliant, partially compliant, and there is one row with one country in it that says non-compliant, and that is Trinidad and Tobago. But the honorable member for Naparima, who quoted the existence of my grandfather, who was born in 1923, nearly 100 years ago, talking about his work in the Constitution, this honorable member disgracing the seat of Naparima from an intellectual perspective in his argument, in his argument, 
comes here to say to Trinidad and Tobago that he can't understand that. Because he thinks it's the EU regulating yeah. the global forum. And advising the government on that. Advising the country, Madam Speaker. And advising the government on that basis, starting on the wrong leg entirely, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, the global forum has said to us, you have to at least demonstrate best efforts. The best efforts in involves us dismantling the secrecy provisions in specific reference to of regular in specific reference to the government's proposals the government proposes in amendments recommended in this legislation that we will amend section clause 5 sub clause 6 b etc in a particular way we say that we will include for clarity the references to the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Anti-Terrorism Act, the Prevention of Corruption Act, references to fraud and dishonesty. We say that you shall do so by way of an application to a judge. We do not put a standard inside of there because we're leaving it to the court to determine the standard. And that standard will at best be the standard of a warrant or less. And that is an arguable case, reasonable grounds sort of formula. It's in fact a reasonable ground formula. That allows the common law to continue to develop the standards and for the judge to be satisfied upon information put forward. So Madam Speaker, we specifically propose an amendment which no matter what the UNC says is something that they're actually not saying at all because they will not tell us what the amendments are from May 25th, 2018, to November 30th, 2018, the UNC will not tell us what the amendments are. And I dare say it is because they have none. It is organized chaos, as the honorable member has put it. It is an attempt to delay and protract. But Madam Speaker, we have two bogeys, as the Americans say, facing us two missiles coming at us. Yes. I am the representative acting on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago at the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force and the Financial Action Task Force. And I will have to personally attend before that group in January and explain to them that Trinidad and Tobago is making best efforts. Specifically, the FATF has told us in writing, you see, the UNC says, show us the information. Madam Speaker, it's in writing, and they have it. And the writing that comes out of the FATF is pellucidly clear. It says, quoting from the fourth round mutual evaluation itself, which is published, and which the honorable members have since June 2016, which they are alleging the government must give them no. Since June 2016, with respect to recommendation 40, with respect to inter, um, immediate outcome 2, the paragraphs coming from the mutual evaluation report, paragraph 788, paragraph 395, paragraph 406, 407, paragraph 75, Madam Speaker, in black and white from the mutual evaluation report says to Trinidad and Tobago that there is no provision for income tax officials to exchange information with respect to foreign counterparts in relation to money laundering, terrorist financing, predicate offenses, tracing of proceeds of instrumentalities. That is what they say. Madam Speaker, Clause 5 of the bill, which requires no special majority, will satisfy the FATF. And I, on behalf of the right-thinking people of Trinidad and Tobago, will not be finding myself, if I can, in the clutches of a face-to-face -face interview with international assessors telling them that the UNC refused to pass the law if I have another option. On the other hand, the other clauses I mentioned, six, seven, eight, parts of eight, nine, and 10, they require a special majority. 
to satisfy the global forum. And it may very well be that we have to cleave to achieve. Because whilst the UNC is perfectly content in the people's business collapsing in this country, in poor people suffering, and I want to say how, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, our food importation bill alone is evidence of the need for correspondent banking. Madam Speaker, doubles as a local cuisine that is as Trinidadian as you can get. Tabakit is right. China, 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 China curry. Yes, please. And the West, your original time is now spent. You're entitled to 15 more minutes, if you wish. Please continue. Madam Speaker, doubles, which is as Trinidadian as you could get, and Tabaki caught where I was going. Flour, chana, curry, oil, salt, salt, paper, paper, <laughs> all imported into Trinidad and Tobago. Only thing made as a little. The only thing made as a spoon. Perhaps the only thing pepper. local is the man mixing it. And, and the pepper. pepper. And, and the pepper. So, Madam Speaker, I'm talking to people of Trinidad and Tobago through you. The Global Forum blacklisting has been described not as the sky will fall. Naparima knows that. For a member who constantly quotes Singapore. Oh, God, learn something now from Singapore. Naparima again. <laughs> Spinning. You know what to do. Yeah. So, Madam Speaker. You invited. He, he invited back. It's not a conversation. He invited back when you control it, sir. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the fact is that we have to deal with the consequences of the FATF and the Global Forum. And I was making the point before Naprima interrupted to say that the Global Forum is not that the sky will fall. It is that the food importation items, the ability to make doubles, the ability to buy medicine for heart patients, for diabetes, become more difficult and more expensive progressively. Because there's something called enhanced due diligence, which is part of this report. In this report, the Bankers Association explained it in detail. The Bankers Association gave the explanation as to what remittances are, people getting cash from their relatives who are living abroad, who are sending money for them, churup, churup, as we say in Trinidad, for their old granny and their old mother or their child. That money at Western Union and money transfer is what the UNC will ensure can't pass through. <laughs> and Naparima stands up saying things which he knows not to be true. The sky is going to fall. No, sir. It's a death by a thousand cuts in a painful stretch where it becomes more and more expensive. And it is indefensible, Madam Speaker. Indefensible. Madam Speaker, this country is at crisis point. The opposition wants to say to us now, we don't trust the government. I, I don't mind that, you know, that's parliamentary points. We don't believe in the government. They want us to show them everything which we show. We give them the letters, the reports. We rely upon them being public documents. We rely upon them to have met with the players themselves, the Global Forum. Madam Speaker, the last government sat in the FATF circle, the CFATF circle, for five full years. In the five years I was in that parliament, I never once heard Anand Ram Logan or member for Separia talk about any of these obligations in the manner that we have. We never asked them for a report because we read them, we knew where to find them. We didn't ask them to take us to the meeting and pay for them to listen. We didn't say to them, send the Global Forum and have them meet us. We asked the Global Forum to meet with them because we so don't trust them. We said, listen, you go and talk to the people yourselves. So Madam Speaker, every single goalpost gets shifted. You want meeting, you want joint select committee? No member. We take joint select committee. We're not agreeing in the joint select committee when we come to the House, even though we agreed unanimously to come and take the one bill. 
We have some submissions in the minority report. We're not telling you what they are. Check the South African law. We went, we pulled up the South African law. We modeled the amendments to meet the South African law. We sent it to the leader of the opposition in two written letters. You know what we were met with? Well, forget the South African law thing now. How about if you now consider something else? We said, OK, you want to consider something else? Come back in a debate on the 23rd, as we did, of November. They say they wanted another committee. We said, sure, take another committee. This time, nah, hard luck. We ain't giving any new members. We're not, we not attending. They come, they say, they say to the parliament, poor me, Naparima. I only had 12 hours to read a report. But don't worry the fact that I didn't turn up in the committee where I was supposed to be to do the work, to pay attention, so I wouldn't have 12 hours. Madam Speaker, the first item of business today was, a, was an objection under the standing orders by Siparia. To do what? To delay the debate. Procedural motion. Stop the Let's stop the debate. We didn't have time to consider the report. Was the argument coming from Siparia? Senior counsel. Procedural delay again. So Madam Speaker, the ball is in the court of the UNC. Explain to the country how you could have agreed to FATCA, which is the replicas of clauses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 of the bill. You agree to everything in the FATCA bill. Now is a problem? To discuss what? To come and say what you agreed to and you pass as law unanimously should not be law? That's the argument? The first five clauses don't require a special majority and will take us out of the jeopardy of FATF. And the one clause they have a big problem with is the police having taxpaying information. Big problem with that. We've added in the judicial scrutiny, and it's a simple majority issue, Madam Speaker. I, for the life of me, would like somebody opposite for today's beat, debate to stand up with the bill and tell the country what the problem with the clauses in the bill are. I would like somebody opposite to comply with the correct standing orders and actually put the amendments into writing. I would like somebody to tell me why you didn't turn up for the special select committee where all the stakeholders that you asked to come back again because they came before you know, turned up. I would like somebody opposite Somebody opposite to tell me the what country. the mischief is so that the country will hear. The country hear. Madam Speaker, I don't know how honorable members opposite could look at this issue and have no position other than say, let me talk. Let's talk, but we're not turning up to talk. Madam Speaker. The Honorable Prime Minister told me that there was a meeting earlier today with the leader of the opposition. And a whole team. A team, a recorder, a note taker, a, a cameraman, a lawyer. You know what you call a, 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 a band of people? In that meeting, not a single submission as to what the problem is. In the clauses of the bill. In the clauses of the bill, as the Honorable Prime Minister says. So, Madam Speaker. I'm at a genuine loss. The Petrotrain Gallery thing didn't work. We somehow fabricated on May 25th that, the, that November 30th was going to be a day to discuss an issue of national concern, which this bill is, somehow. Point of Pay will explain that to me. Yeah. Nord will explain that to me. And the people through you, Madam Speaker, will hear from Tabakit and Carney Central, because today is the day. There's no bluff, there's no gambage, there's no gallery. This is the business of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I don't have a name here, Madam Speaker. My name does not appear on any sign in this parliament. I'm San Fernando West. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister is Diego Martin West. That's 60,000 people sitting in two seats right here. 
This is the people's business. Mm -hmm. And I'm very genuinely upset that there could be a cavalier approach by the members opposite, and we can't get a shred of understanding from it. It's up to you. We'll see what you do. Because we here are prepared to vote. And when the Prime Minister said all of us are available to vote, we are still here, available to work. And our members who may be absent are on official people's business. They're not on a, a line going to India with 10,000 people or going to St. Lucia or going to Guyana exactly. to fete and celebrate the 24th of May. And embarrass us in Jamaica. That's not what they're doing, Madam Speaker. They're on the people's business. I don't know how the Prime Minister and Minister Young do it. They get on a plane and go for one day to a meeting and come back same day. Minister Young traveled all the way to Japan. Took him three days to get there. One day at meetings and three days back, arrived at the airport with his eyes bloodshot red and went straight back to work. You think my friends opposite have a track record like that? No. Madam Speaker, I think I've said enough. The committee stage of this bill when we get it, I think we'll speak volumes. I thank you. Member for Karani Central. I would like to say to, to the Honorable Attorney General, through you, Madam Speaker, that the opposition did not participate in the special select committee because we opposed the idea of a special select committee from the beginning. If we would read the standing orders of this parliament, we would see that there is an official period from July to the end of August in which members of parliament are given the liberty, because it is in the standing orders, to be able to plan their business outside of parliamentary obligations. And although the members on the opposite side have violated those standing orders on occasion, the Members of the opposition have a right, if they have to travel or do business other than parliamentary business, to do that during the period between July and early September, the end of August, when they are guaranteed that time by the parliament. So for the member for San Fernando West and Attorney General to speak about the fact that they did not want to meet during that period. I think the member for San Fernando West would better explain why it is, given the mandate of handling three bills, they only handled one bill and brought it here as a full report of the committee. Now, the Attorney General, you know, likes to be pejorative, likes to ridicule members of the House. And you were sitting there, Madam Speaker, and listening to his speech as I was listening. But if you say anything here in the House, he's one of the first to get up and cite a standing order. The he likes to use scare tactics, as he does here, you know, all the things that would happen. If we, if we got here to this point, Mr. Attorney General, where today is the deadline, and everything is going to fall down because we did not meet this deadline, how did we get here? Who brought us here? I am responding uh, to the member for Karani Central. You haven't heard yet what I've risen to say. Okay? Now, I would like to just caution all members. 
in that what we are here is about a specific report which is before us. I allowed for sort of context the member for Naparima to deal extensively with a lot of matters which I would call historical. Those matters were responded to by the Attorney General. And therefore, I am going to be very, very strict moving forward from here with respect to what is before us. I think the history has been given on one side, and all the other statements that are attendant to that, those were answered. This debate is not about the history. This debate is now about something specific before us, which is the report of the Special Select Committee. I allowed you, Karen Central, to deal with the fact of answer why you all weren't there. I am not going to allow any member to go back now again into history. We are dealing with something specifically before us. Madam Speaker, with all due respect to you, the Attorney General spoke. This is a debate. I am responding to things that the Attorney General said. And I ask that under the clear rules of Parliament that I be allowed to respond to the Attorney General. And, and, and Member for Carney Central, under the clear rules of Parliament you are, and debate, you are allowed to respond. Yes. And all I'm saying is that as far as the matters relate to what is before us today, I'm not at all. I am not at all going to restrict that. As far as historical matters, it was raised on one side, it was responded to by another side, on the other side, I am not going to let a second, third, fourth bite of that same ch cherry. Let's deal with what is before us today, please. Thank you. Madam, I assure you that I will debate the matter before this House, which is the bill. But please. I want to ask you, please. Continue, please, Member for Kearney Central. Please continue. If this bill was so important, Mr. A.G., why don't you just work backwards from what you had to do to make sure that the agenda was achieved? So that we could get a desirable outcome. But I, I sense something here, you know. The AG worked through the bill, clause by clause. And he worked through the, clause, cl the bill clause by clause, and he said he cited every single clause which did not require a special majority. And he went through the clauses, I think he identified them, as 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, which require a special majority. And he went on to say, that he is not going to go before any international committee and have to explain why the government, so to speak, the country, is not ready. And he's not about to say that he is not able to deliver because of the opposition. And I sense that what the AG is saying Madam Speaker, is that he is prepared in this bill to take out the clauses that have to do with the special majority and to pass an innocuous bill in order to make an international arrangement. If the AG does not mean to say so, I'm prepared to sit down for him to respond. Madam Speaker, the Honourable Member is giving way. The debate is on. It may be premature of me to make that recommendation if the, honorable, if the honorable members are agreeing to pass the bill. So the ball is in your court. The ball is in all of our courts. Yeah, yeah. So, the Attorney General, Madam Speaker, even by his intervention now is basically saying 
that he is prepared to take a certain course to water down this bill in order to proceed in a certain way. And I want to say, I want to say that part of the problem that we have in handling legislation in this parliament is the way the government indeed handles legislation. So for instance, Madam Speaker, the AG shared with us some time ago, about a year after they came into office, a legislative agenda. Yeah. <laughs> and if you look at the legislation that we have had before this House since that time, there is a very wide gap between the stated legislation agenda and what we have been discussing in this House. The There have been a series of special majority laws that, are brought be, that have been brought before this Honorable House, Madam Speaker. And in bringing those pieces of legislation which require a special majority, the strategy and the style is always to browbeat the opposition, first in parliament, and secondly outside, in order to get the opposition to conform. I can cite examples, but it's not necessary, because everyone in this parliament is aware of it, and the general public is aware of it as well. Now, there have been instances as well where the Attorney General has brought at least one bill which started out with a special majority. And he has reversed that process and caused it to be passed by simple majority. So I am relating to this matter to what I sense as the AG's strategy for dealing with this particular matter and the opposition here today. Some of these have been tested in court and found wanted. Okay. Now, whenever they've had bills that require a simple majority, any amendments that we put forward never count. They're never taken into account. And when there is a bill that requires two-thirds majority, as long as we were to articulate them or put them forward, they suddenly are confiscated by the government and then brought as the amendments in the House of Representatives. This, this is their pattern. Member Fanaparima, certain language, please. All right, please. Member Fikarinson. Okay. This is their pattern. But this particular bill here today, the AG also mentioned about the Tax Information Exchange Treaty of 1989, of which I was part. And that was a different time. I remember in the committee meeting when we met on that matter, the AG wasn't even aware, aware that we had this exchange treaty agreement with the US. And it was the head of the BIR who indicated to us that this law was in fact passed in 1989. And the, the, the double taxation agreement, sorry. And uh, what's that? It is true, it's a fact. And uh, and that bill was the one that made it possible. And uh, 
It is a different time today. It's a more complex time. It's a very difficult time. And it is not that we are not aware of the consequences for banks, Madam Speaker. We understand what is happening in the world system. We understand that big banks abroad do, don't, do not want to worry about little banks in little countries and little customers in these countries when they could be going after the customers in the world, which are huge asset base and that are more lucrative to them in the banking industry. We understand that very well. And we understand what are the implications for the banks here. We are very sensitive to it because we understand it's not just a banking problem. It's a customer problem, and it's a country problem. We know the consequences for business. If your banks are in jeopardy and in difficulty, it is very hard to conduct international business. It's hard to export. It's hard, it's hard to import. We understand it very well. We know the consequences for our citizens. And I heard the AG using his emotional best appeal today, <laughs> talking about the consequences for ordinary citizens. We understand that. Double. If you have to get a cash transfer, if you have to use a credit card or buy something online, we understand it very well. We know the consequences for Trinidad and Tobago. Because if we allowed ourselves to slip in the global system and became one of those backward countries, what would happen to us is that we would find it very difficult to navigate regionally and internationally in the world. And we understand those things. But all of these things and all of these concerns, Madam, Deputy, Madam Speaker, does not take away from the government the responsibility of meeting its international obligations, meeting its parliamentary obligations, and meeting its legislative agenda obligations properly. And I want to say that, in my estimation, they have entirely failed on three counts. They have mismanaged their international relations because all the issues he is accusing the member for Naparima about not understanding. It is because they f were confused about the obligation to the OECD, the Global Forum, FATF, etc., etc., that we end up in this position. And you have one Minister of Finance following one agenda, and the AG following another agenda, and all of them cracking into one another. Don't come here and blame the opposition for your incompetence. And then come in the parliament and blame us. Set up meeting on the political platform to blame us and to vilify us. And get, and get the business. I want to hear a member for Karani Central. And you see this animated kind of behavior? I don't think it's parliamentary. I'm not going to tolerate it. Member for Karani Central, please continue. And uh, so you do all of these things. You, you make mistakes. You cause blunders. You get us into a situation where always all of these things, every one of them is a crisis. What about the clause? I know the clauses. I could tell you. I could tell you. I wouldn't be sidetracked by you. You always want to tell us who should speak on this side. But for Carney Central, if you just ignore the crosstalk and direct your contribution here, I'm, I'm sure you, know, you wouldn't be sidetracked at all. Just directed this way. And I will just advise the members of the front bench on my right to please observe standing order 53. 
I would like to hear Karani Central, please. As I said, you created a crisis, and the end result is that we are here. And not only did you now politicize it on the platform, politicize it here, but you got the business community to get up and speak about it. You say here that all of them, everybody, want the bill to pass without amendment. That is not true. That is not true at all. They want the bill to pass, as we want the bill to pass. They want the other two pieces of legislation and any other related, uh, related pieces of legislation to pass because what are the bankers concerned about? They are concerned about corresponding, correspondence, okay. sorry, banking, and they are, uh, they are concerned about not being in a situation where they are less than a stand-up bank in the world system. That is what they are interested in. And they are not concerned about some of the issues here, anything other than what would give them the integrity as a, banking, as a bank or as a banking sector. The business community, too, wants to do its business, and that's what they're concerned about. But we, in the legislature, have to be concerned about more things, including, and this is an important aspect of parliamentary duty, which is public interest, public good. That is part of it. It is a very important part of it. And you can't come here last minute creating a crisis creating a situation in which you take us to the edge, so to speak, telling the country that we are taking you to the edge, as you did with FATCA, as you did with the anti-gang bill, and as you are now doing with this income tax bill. And as the Minister of Finance rightly said, you have two bills there, in committee suspended now because of how you have handled that particular Joint Select Committee, which also need to be addressed in this country. Now, in this document here, we have... Boom. 53, standing order, 53. I... Members, Diego Martin, Northeast, Port of Spain, North, could you all kindly please contain the talk and the level? Okay. We are here to listen to member for Karani Central. Please continue, member. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In this particular document here, we have the report. Okay. We have the amended bill. We have the report on the stakeholder consultation. We have Well, I will, I will stop at that point, because I want to make a few points on some of these. When you read on page 7 here, you read Forum Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes. And you have here 2.16, according to the Global, Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information. I simply want to point to one phrase. Implementation of standards of transparency and exchange of information for tax purposes. So in a fundamental way, this whole bill is about exchange under conditions of transparency. And yet in this bill in which the major concern, Madam Speaker, is transparency of transactions involving customers with bank accounts who are under the jurisdictional authority of the particular signatories to these um, agreements, one of the issues that has come up in the debate in the Joint Select Committee and in the Parliament and in the letter of the leader of the opposition 
to the Minister of Finance is the question of transparency and distribution of information. So here you are debating a bill about transparency and free exchange of information. And you don't have transparency here and free exchange of information among the members of the parliament. What a shame. The second thing is the The second thing is that the way the report is written, Madam Speaker. If you look on page 10, 2.34, it says here, furthermore, during the public hearing on Wednesday, November 28, 2018, the deputy chairperson of NAMLC cautioned that if the income tax amendment bill 20, 2018 was not passed by November 30th, and this would result in non-grading of Trinidad and Tobago from a gray list to a blacklist. This in turn will result in measures meted out to Trinidad and Tobago by correspondent banks, some of which are highlighted in 2.3. I wonder if this person knows that we are on the blacklist already for nearly a year. <laughs> I, I wonder if the government knows that. And I wonder if the government knows that it's said in this parliament that the reason they want to pass this bill and the reason they send the other two bills to the Joint Select Committee to be considered together to come to the parliament was because they wanted to get off of the back. And they want to come and accuse us of laziness and sloppy thinking. Boy, I don't think Olio was ready for government. Government. In, <laughs> the next 50 years. Olio wasn't ready for government in 2015, and everything in the last three and a half years tells you that you're never going to be ready. I want to say that. In the stakeholders' consultation here, contrary to what the AG says, that all of them want to pass a bill without amendment, that is not true. There are issues that are raised here. I will not raise the matter of Amcham because it concerns my son. But whatever he said, I can tell you it comes from a good, solid, independent mind. <laughs> And the second thing that I would like to say is that there are other chambers in here, other than AMCHAM, that mention the fact that they have concerns that they want addressed in the legislation as well. I want to say as well that the would, if the AG and the Minister of Finance would probably agree that this version of the bill which they brought from the select committee in which we did not participate is a better version of the bill than the one that came here a week ago. If they would agree to that, I would like to say that they should say thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. They should say thank you to the opposition for raising the issues, piling on the pressure for the leader of the opposition for writing a letter to the Minister of Finance, for raising all the issues of concern, issues which they did not take into account in the JSC, which they took into account in the Parliament after the JSC, and other issues which they took into account on the basis of issues raised in the letter, and issues raised in the public domain by translation of the issues in that letter to the, to the public at large through the media. And we thank the media for that. Well put it. So this might be a better version of the bill. But notwithstanding that, it is not 
the desirable version that we want that is complementary to the other two. What is that piece wrong with it? I do not wish I do not wish to engage the AG in that matter. The AG had 45 minutes so, to speak. And he says, I am engaging the bill. What you want? Please leave Karani Central. Member for Karani Central, you, you continue, please. Direct your contribution this way. OK. So the opposition resistance has been a significant contribution to democracy in this country. It was a significant contribution to the passage of a superior FATCA yes. bill, no matter what they say. Honorable members, it's now 4.30. Um, I think now is a convenient time to take the suspension. Member for Karani Central, when we return, you have 50. Member for Karani Central, when we return, you'll have 50 seconds of your original time left. 50 seconds of your original time and 15 minutes so that if you ask now for the extension, then you will, I will have to interrupt you after 50 seconds. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, I'll take the extension. Is the extension 50 seconds or 50 seconds? <laughs> it will be 15 minutes and 50 seconds. Yeah, okay, so I can continue. Yes, yes. Honorable members, uh, we'll now take the suspension. We'll return at 5 o'clock. This house now stands suspended.